Okay, this is the second advent, the second coming of Christ. This is the back of the book. Don't leave before you read the back of the book. The return of Christ. No one knows the day. Not even the Son. You know that Jesus Christ even said, I don't know when I'm coming back. Jesus said that. I didn't make that up. Mark 13, 32. No man knows the hour of the Son of Man, not even the Son of Man. Jesus did not know when he was going to come back. That's a very, very interesting point. Jesus clearly foretold of his return, yet added that no one knew, not even him. Most people don't know that. But... Nevertheless, we can deduce from the scriptural verse, surely the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. Amos 3, 7, that God will surely reveal all secrets about the second heaven to his prophets before he carries out his work. Do you think for one minute that God's going to leave you in the dark about the most momentous occasion in human history? No, <laughs> not at all. And you are sitting where you're going to hear the cutting edge of religious thought is the Unification Church. I've been in this church for 38 years. I've studied every major religion on earth. 38 years, I didn't leave. I heard this the first time, and I didn't leave. I was so blown away. And this is the lecture that got me. I said before, I said, if you're thinking about leaving and going home, think twice. I'd heard five lectures. We're doing eh, one, two, three, four, eh, five lectures. There's six. There's a total of six. I had heard the first five in uh, San Bernardino, in the mountains of San Bernardino. I was really impressed. What a great group of people. You're, you're doing God's work. You're doing the, you're working the vineyard. Thanks a lot, I heard the fifth lecture. I'm ready to go home now. And I'll be a good boy from now on. And the people that were there gathered around me and said, John, hello? <laughs> There's one more lecture. One more lecture? Uh, well, this is really good stuff, but I, I, I'm sure I've heard it before. And they said, no, you haven't. <laughs> and they were exactly right. Again, that was 38 years ago. <laughs> Again, thinking caps on, seat belts fastened, right? You'll need that. Okay, here we go. Bang. God will, however, give illumination to those of open heart and mind, the meek of the earth, the very fact that you can even sit in those chairs right now means you are the meek of the earth. You are the chosen of God. You are the chosen of God. Whether you know it or not, whether you believe it or not, the fact that you can sit in that seat means you're not like everybody else. You're seeking more. You're looking for more. You want to know more. You're not satisfied with where you're at. And that's a good thing. Perspectives on the Bible, essential matters of God's will, parables and symbols. The Bible is rife with symbolic imagery and parables, things that are hard to understand. The prophecies regarding the second coming of Christ are written for one particular generation of believers to be prepared to receive him. You just happen to be those people. You just happen to be in the last days. It has to come. At some point, the apocalypse has to happen. And it just so happens, out of the timeline of history, you happen to have been born when it's happening. And we're going to prove it today. This is not just my supposition. We're going to prove it. We're going to nail it. Dates and times. The Bible and New Truth. Jesus said, not me. I can't make this stuff up. I have never inserted one thing into the divine principle that isn't already there. This is straight out of the Bible. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. This is Jesus in the 16th chapter of John. How be it, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, something in the future, he will guide you into some truth? All truth. All truth. For he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he hears, he will speak, and he will show you the things that are to come. It's a promise. It's a pledge. There's coming a time. This is Jesus while he's alive. There's coming a time. I'm not going to hold anything back. He said, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Clearly, Jesus is withholding an enormous volume of truth. Why? He's the one that talked about, don't throw your pearls before swine. They'll trample them underfoot. Nobody was paying attention. Nobody cared. You cast out devils by the power of Satan. Get out of here. 
up on the cross with you. These things have I spoken to you in Proverbs, but the time comes when I shall no more speak to you in Proverbs, but I will show you plainly of the Father. I think by the principle of creation, you have seen plainly of the Father like nothing in your life. God is revealing himself now through science, not speculation. Just believe, brother. Believe in the by and by. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. That's gone. That day, that day is gone. That dog won't hunt. It's science. It's the Higgs boson. It's dark matter. It's black holes. It's subatomic theory. It's Max Planck. Max Planck was a lifelong Christian. Got the Nobel Peace Prize in 1918 for physics. In 1944, he said, In all my investigations, I'm telling you, there's an invisible mind ruling the universe. This is a man who spent his entire life in the subatomic realm, like this all the time. So now, this scripture is being fulfilled in the 20th and 21st centuries. I will tell you plainly of the Father. I will show you how God is made up. What God is made of. We're in a very special time. Adam and Eve started out in the ideal. They fell. God could have just left us there. God couldn't have left us there. There's no way God could have left us there. Imagine if he did, though. Ugh, this line would be... Ugh. Just nothing but blackness and horror for the rest of eternity. But God began right away to restore mankind, to do something about his creation. Even though God did not create the fall, God took responsibility for the fall. Even though you don't steal something, you take responsibility for your children when they do. How much more does God do the same thing? Jesus said, you being evil know how to give gifts to your children. How much will your heavenly father give them that love him? God begins right away with Moses. Then Jesus. Jesus says there's going to be a new age. There's going to be a second coming of Christ. God's revelation is progressive and upward moving. As technology and science evolves, man evolves, God evolves, God's truth is revealed on a deeper and deeper level. Now, again, like I said, we're talking about Higgs bosons. We're talking about dark matter. We're talking about cosmic principles. Do you know that Michio Kaku, one of the, the, the preeminent physicists of this day, is now entertaining the idea of multiple universes. The term multiple universes is now a common term in the, in the uh, 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 physical sciences. So we are in a special time. This is a very special time. There's never been the kind of uh, scientific advance as the 20th and 21st century. And it's going to get more and more intense. It's going to get weirder and weirder. You're going to be able to do more and more with less and less. <laughs> Phones get smaller. Capability gets better. What I'm doing on this podium right here, one thousandth of that used to be done by the ENIAC computer, which was an entire city block of thousands and tens of thousands of snapping tubes and clickers. Didn't even get close to this. <laughs> And it's very interesting to note that from the fall to Moses, Moses to Jesus, Jesus to now, 2,000 year increments. Very, very interesting. God is methodical. God is the king of time. God is the ultimate scientist. God is the ultimate timekeeper. Very interesting. We have just passed the year 2000, just a few short years ago. We should not be surprised in the least that some major revelation of God is now coming into the earth. Because it's happened every 2,000 years. You can count it. You can set your clock by this. For my money and 38 years of experience, I would tell you, divine principle is the latest evolution of God's truth in the world today. Boom. God's been trying to bring back the ideal. It's a long, slow, what a long, strange trip it's been. Trying to bring back the ideal. Thousands and thousands of years, but it's coming. It's coming. Nothing can stop it. We want to answer the questions. How? When? Where? Yes, we can have the audacity to say now, we do know. Because, not because we're so cool or we're so smart, but that God is revealing. God is revealing those questions. Will the Messiah return? Section one. How will Christ return? Well, is there any precedent? There is precedent to know. 
when the second coming will happen. How did the second advent of Elijah take place? There was a second coming of Elijah. 2 Kings 2.11, Malachi 4.5.6, boom. The reality born on the earth. Expectation was in the clouds based on 2 Kings. The reality born on earth. Comparison, very important. Seat belts fastened, thingy caps on. Different name, different person, same mission with the spirit and power of Elijah. Precedent is what it's called. Precedent. How was Christ expected to come? The first time. Well, according to Daniel 7.13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, capital S, very important Son of Man, came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him a dominion, a glory, a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. This was the expectation for the first coming of Christ. The Jews were expecting, based on Daniel 7.13, this is how our Lord will come. As a military conqueror, a leader. Of course, they'd just come, in, come out of oppression under Egypt for 400 years. That's exactly what they're looking for. They need liberation. They're getting hounded all over the planet, persecuted everywhere they go. The Jews have never been able to get a break. Even now, half the world is after the Jews. Anti-Semitism is, is rearing its ugly head in America like never before. On college campuses, they're spraying swastikas and persecuting Jews and harassing them. Their whole history has been like that. How was Christ expected? Isaiah 9, 6, same thing. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, the government, etc. Kingdom, order it, judgment, justice, bang, bang, bang. They're expecting a mighty king, not a humble carpenter from Nazareth. A mighty king with a great big sword to cut down their enemies. This expected on the clouds. The Jews then murmured at him and he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I came down from heaven? They couldn't put this together. What's wrong with this guy? What's he talking about? John 6, 3, For the bread of God is he that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus is saying that first person. He's saying, I'm here. Come with me. Listen to my words. Do what I say. He said, you are my friends if you do that which I command you to do. You see? He is the bread of life. Right? Partake <laughs> is the point. Partake. Second John 1, 7. Remember this idea of Christ coming from the sky as a military conqueror was so deeply entrenched into Jewish culture that it led John to say, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, the same as a deceiver and antichrist. Because that feeling was so strong. When they came to the early Jews and said, look, Jesus is the Messiah, they just go, what? Daniel 7.13 says he's coming from the sky. Isaiah 9, 6, we're looking for a military conqueror, man. I don't know what you're talking about. And John said, this is the spirit of Antichrist. People denying Christ come in the flesh. And what are Christians doing today? Same thing, same expectation. They're expecting miracles and signs from the sky. Pastor Frank explained the consummation of human history. It's all symbolic imagery, symbolic metaphor. We're going to deal with that too. Many assert that Daniel 7.13's prophecy concerns the second advent of Christ. Oh, well, that applies to the second coming. Of course. Oh, really? Oh, really? Let's shred that one. However, in the Old Testament age, God worked to fulfill the entire purpose of restoration through the coming of Jesus as the Bible attests. And here it is. I can't make this stuff up. I'd love to defend this in court. <laughs> I hope one day I get a chance. Matthew 11.13, For all the law and the prophets prophesied, until John, and if you will receive it, this is Elijah who was to come. Not might be, could be, kind of like him. Is Elijah who was to come. The Old Testament prophesies the first coming of Christ and nothing more. It stops right there. New Testament, Revelation, strictly second coming. <gasps> 
cop to it. The Bible says so. It all stopped with John the Baptist. Elijah was the last scripture of the Old Testament. Malachi 4, 5. I will send you Elijah the prophet. Jesus said, the prophets prophesied until John. Once John comes, that's it. Old Testament is closed. <laughs> Jesus opens up an entire new chapter. It is obvious to the Jews at the time considered that Daniel's prophecy referred to what they believed was the first and only coming of the Messiah. Indeed, the Old Testament prophets were applicable to the first coming of Christ alone. The New Testament and book of Revelation pertain to the second coming. Old Testament has nothing to do with the second coming of Christ. Not one jot or tittle, as they say. Jesus' first advent, expected on the clouds. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? We have seen a star in the east, or come to worship him. Herod heard these things. He was troubled, and Jerusalem with him. All Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes, the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea. Somebody got it. Somebody got it. For it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art now the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Interesting. Interesting. Old Testament applies to Jesus. New, uh, first coming. New Testament applies to second coming. How was Christ expected the first time? We're talking about precedent. We already have a precedent for a second coming of Elijah. So there's, there's track record here already. Does that apply to Jesus as well? Let's take a look. How was Christ expected the first time? Elijah was expected from the sky based on 2 Kings and Malachi 4-5. Reality was born on earth. S different name, different person, same mission, spirit and power of Elijah. So the expectation was in the clouds. Yeah, based on several scriptures, the expectation was oh, Christ will come from the sky. Reality? Excuse me, Micah 5, 2, Isaiah 7, 14, a virgin will conceive, 2 John, those that say he didn't come in the flesh are Antichrist, born on the earth. Comparison, uh-oh, was not recognized as a Messiah by Israel, persecuted, and ultimately crucified. John the Baptist, decapitated. Mm. How is Christ now expected to come? Seatbelts fastened, thinking caps on. <laughs> they say that history repeats itself. It's not just a cliche. <laughs> it really does. In the worst of ways. Revelation 1-7. Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Matthew 24-30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Where have we heard this before? Old Testament, Daniel and Isaiah, predicting the first coming of Christ. Christians are waiting for the same thing today. Watch out. I used to believe this lock, stock, and barrel that Christ would come dumping out of the sky with trumpets and banging pots and pans and Mm-mm, mm-mm. God doesn't work that way. Never did. <laughs> First Thessalonians 4, oh, this is the rapture. Oh, this proves it. Christ has come from the sky. Paul said so. Boy, we're going to shred this one. <laughs> First Thessalonians 4, 16, for we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wow, I'm defeated. I lose. He, he, he. <laughs> this is Paul. Paul, number one, never met Jesus. Paul is interpreting for the disciples. Do you remember in... In Matthew, it says the disciples of Jesus came to him saying, Master, why do the scribes and Pharisees say that Elijah must first come? What does that tell you about the disciples of Jesus? 
they know nothing of scripture. They know nothing. They were simple tax collectors, fishermen, alcoholics, prostitutes, whatever, anybody, the, the meek of the earth, anybody that would listen to Jesus were usually very humble people with very difficult backgrounds, <laughs> right? So Paul is not speaking as a revelator. He doesn't say, I speak by virtue of revelation from God directly. No. The disciples must have been coming to Paul, who was a Pharisee. Paul could quote the Old Testament chapter and verse, the, the, the Torah. He was a Pharisee. He was an exemplary Jew, which he said, in, I have no spot or blemish. He followed the law fastidiously. The disciples are probably coming to him and asking him, Paul, you know, before Jesus left in Matthew 24, he said that he would be coming in the clouds and what are we supposed to understand by that? Paul is interpreting. Clearly, Paul is interpreting for them what Jesus must have meant. And he figures it out exactly from his perspective. It's actually a very good explanation. Yeah, it makes sense that people have already died in Christ. They would go first. How can we possibly precede people who have sacrificed for Christ for years? They must be coming out of the ground to meet Jesus, and then we'll go. He's putting two and two together. But he's not speaking as a revelator. This is his assumption. That's all this is, is his assumption. Why clouds then? Why does God use this clouds thing so much? Use it with Elijah, use it with John the Baptist, use it with second coming. This clouds thing seems to be a problem. Well, it's easy to explain. In Jude 1.12, it says, These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are. Referring to people. Assigning the symbolic imagery of a cloud without water, carried about by winds. Trees, we already saw a tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil. People being alluded to as trees, clouds, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves, wandering stars. There's all kinds of metaphors for people that have no root, people that have no spiritual basis. I'm talking about people that just come and go and have no character. Clouds they are, referring to people as clouds. Remember that. Revelation 17:15. The waters that you saw, the angel is interpreting John's revelation. The waters that you saw in your vision where the harlot is seated. The harlot is someone bad. This is not like a, a heavenly queen. This is a harlot. Peoples, multitudes, nations, tongue means the fallen world. This is not the, he's not talking about heaven. He's talking about the fallen earthly world. In the Bible, water often symbolizes fallen people. In other words, the fallen world. So now we're going to start putting this together. Now we're going to find out where these clouds are coming from. All right? Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. The Lord comes with holy myriads, angels, angelic hosts, armies of heaven. The Bible uses the symbolism of clouds to indicate multitudes. It's people. The clouds are symbolic for people. What does it look like? We can deduce that clouds symbolize devout believers whose hearts dwell in heaven and not on earth because they have been reborn and raised from their fallen state. So, Revelation 17, 15, the water equals fallen people. Now here we go. Now we'll understand where these clouds come from. God's like the sun. God's love and truth are constantly hitting the fallen world. Like the physical sun hits dirty water in the ocean. It doesn't matter how dirty that water is, when it finally ascends as clouds and comes over land, you can drink it. It's pure enough to drink. So this is what's happening. God's love and truth are hitting through the, their, his revelation, hitting the fallen world. People that recognize that truth, you've come out of the fallen world to hear divine principle. You are responding to God's love and truth. You are coming out, you're resurrecting as clouds, that's what should have happened at the first coming of Christ. People should have come out of the fallen world, recognized the Messiah, and followed him. That's the clouds. That's why God uses this metaphor. And it serves two purposes. The second purpose is no one can duplicate it. No one can duplicate it. No one can just walk up to you and go, Hi, I'm the Messiah. If you're a Christian, you're going to go, Where are your clouds, dude? The Jews went to Jesus. Where are your clouds, man? Isaiah 9. Daniel 7, Isaiah 11, 
I need clouds. I've got to see clouds. You can't be the Messiah. It's impossible. God does that on purpose to protect the foundation while God's foundation is happening on earth. No one can come. Imagine. Imagine, if you will, if God would have said, and we have to ask ourselves the question, why didn't God just say, a man named Jesus will come to a town called Bethlehem, his father will be Joseph, his mother will be Mary. Why didn't God just make it easy? Human nature. God knows human nature. Can you imagine if when the real Jesus appears, how many Marys, how many Josephs, how many Jesus are going to be already there? People are going to go wacky. Oh, they'll get like, you know, they'll eat something bad and think, oh, maybe I'm Joseph. Uh, my wife's name is Mary. Uh, people get all confused. By the time the real Jesus comes, the place will be littered with Jesus's, Marys, and Josephs. That's why God says, Emmanuel, which simply means God with us. What happens? We talked about that in the mission of the Messiah. Gabriel comes directly to the high priest of Israel and says, your son will be Elijah. Someone that the people respect 100% gets revelation. They were perfectly prepared to accept John the Baptist as the Messiah based on the miracles around his birth then all their presuppositions about clouds and this and that and mighty conquerors goes right out the window. They respect Zechariah so much, they're perfectly willing to accept his son as the Messiah. That's how the whole thing breaks open and the new providence opens up. That's why God uses that metaphor. To protect the foundation while it's going on, while the foundation is rolling out on earth, no one can fake that. It's too big. Jesus made several very interesting statements concerning the second coming, anticipating events of that time, many times speaking in third person. Seat belts fastened, thinking caps on. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. So coming out of the sky, banging pots and pans and shotguns going off, trumpets, ain't going to happen. Jesus said, it ain't going to happen. That's not me. I can't invent that. I won't make this stuff up. There's, there's dire warnings in the scripture about adding to and taking from scripture. Your name will be taken from the book of life, man. I take this really serious. <laughs> I can't make this stuff up. Not coming with signs to be observed. No, there will be no trumpets. There will be no clouds opening up. It will be just as quiet as the first coming. Luke 17, as the lightning flashes out of one part of heaven, the Son of Man will be in his day. But he, what, must first suffer and be rejected of this generation. Wait a minute. Why is Jesus speaking of himself in second person? When John goes to the store, will he find bread? When I go to the store, will I find bread? Why is he speaking in third person? Thus shall it be when the Son of Man is revealed. If, if Jesus is coming out of the sky with banging pots and pans and trumpets, there's nothing that needs to be revealed. <laughs> it's pretty much self-evident, don't you think? He. He will avenge them speedily. Howbeit, when the Son of Man comes, <laughs> will he find faith on earth? What in the world is he talking about? I will avenge them speedily. Howbeit, when I come, will I find faith on earth? If Jesus is personally coming into Second Advent, why is he not speaking in first person? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. He's talking about someone else. And if First Thessalonians 4, 16, 17 is literal, how can the preceding happen? How can this possibly be? If Jesus is coming out of the sky, who in the world, in their right mind, is going to deny that? When Jesus comes out of the sky, is it too late to believe at that point? <laughs> oh, you see Jesus coming out of the sky with trumpets and clouds and all this, and you go, ah, come on. You'd have to be the worst, you'd have to be an Al Qaeda to do something like that. You're going to be on your face. Please forgive me for my sin. Oh, please take me. <laughs> that would 
That's the only thing that's going to come out of your pie hole. <laughs> Please forgive me, Lord, for being such a dope. <laughs> so 1 Thessalonians, the, the rapture cannot be literal. It's impossible. No one, the most hardened communist, would still go, Oh, I believe! Salvation is based on belief. You can believe on your deathbed and be saved. The second before you take your last breath, I believe. From the Christian perspective, you just got saved. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Even unbelievers would have faith in the second advent if the Lord literally comes on the clouds of heaven. Even the most hardened, criminal, atheist, murderous thug <laughs> on earth would go, Wow, I can't beat that trick. If he returns on the clouds, all Christians will have faith. However, if he turns as a man of humble origins, they'll have no faith, just like 2,000 years ago. Jesus didn't meet the criteria for Messiahship from the Jewish perspective, based on their understanding of Scripture. Likewise, the second coming will not meet the standard of Christian interpretation of Scripture at the second coming. Same thing. How do I know this? I was a born-again fundamentalist when I came here. I know of what I speak. Jesus grieved after foreseeing that at the second advent, when Christ returns to the earth as a man of humble origins, he may not find any faith, as was the case in Jesus' day. Human nature remains the same. It doesn't change. No matter how sophisticated we get scientifically, technologically, Human nature still remains the same. Matthew 7, 21 and 23. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? It says, in the last days, many will come to me, Jesus said, and will say, did we not prophesy in your name? Uh, did we not cast out many devil, devils in your name? Do many great works in your name? Jesus will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Who's casting out devils in the name of, of Jesus? Who's doing many mighty works in the name of Jesus? Buddhists? Muslims? Jewish rabbis? Christians. And Christian, and Jesus will say to them, uh-uh, no, I didn't know you. At the second advent of Christ, those Christians who expect his miraculous and glorious appearance will certainly, almost certainly reject him if he comes in the flesh of humble birth. Then the Lord will be left with no choice but to abandon them because they will have transgressed against God. What did Jesus do? He invited the leaders to the marriage supper, the, 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 the marriage feast. They wouldn't come. Then what did he say? Okay, go get the lame, the halt, and the crippled. Find whatever you can. The leaders wouldn't come. So Jesus had to take whatever he could and had to leave the leadership behind. It would be much better for Zechariah to come, John the Baptist to come, all the scribes, the Pharisees, the Levites, the priestly class all around Jesus supporting him 100%. Remember connecting him to the Roman Empire, Roman Empire connecting Jesus to the world. None of that happened. John the Baptist was killed. Jesus Christ was assassinated. Israel was destroyed. That's not a sign of success from my humble perspective. Matthew 11, about John the Baptist. If you will receive it, this is Elijah who was to come. He that has ears, let him hear. If you have ears, you hear. You learn the lessons of history. It means your ears suddenly turn into radio stations. You're ready for anything. You have the humility of heart. As Peter talked about, God resists the proud but bestows grace upon the humble. Don't assume anything. Be very careful who you call a cult. Be very careful. Acts 23.5 talked about the sect of the Nazarenes. Today's cult is tomorrow's orthodoxy. He that has ears to hear, when the disciples came and said to him, why speak you in, to them uh, in parables? He answered, said to them, because it's given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not given. In other words, they're already gone. They've already closed their ears. They've already closed their minds and their hearts off. There's nothing I can do with them. It's all over. This is Matthew 13. By this point, Jesus knows where, he, where he's going. He knows how this story is going to end. Ears to hear, difficult to accept, but sorry, it's true. Now, 
Here's where the rubber really starts hitting the road. You have to tighten those seat belts down just a little bit more. One more notch. Yeah. In the book of Revelation, much of the content is being delivered by Jesus himself. If you look at any red letter edition, it's loaded with Jesus' comments, and they're, and they're all in red. Verse 1. Revelation starts right out, of course, with verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. So, in essence, let's break that down and make sure where this is coming from. Okay. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, signified by his angel and unto his servant, John. So, essentially, we can boil this paragraph down to Revelations come from God to Jesus to the angel to John. I want to be really clear. Really clear. I want to be able to not fit a piece of paper between these concepts. I tell you, when I came here, I was a born-again fundamentalist Christian. And when I got my teeth into this, I never looked back. This just blew my mind. And I never looked back. Revelation 2.26. He who overcomes and does... My will. Whose will? Who's speaking here? Jesus. He who overcomes and does my will to the end to him. Who? Ha! Will I, Jesus, give authority over the nations? He shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. I will also give him the morning star. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Oh boy, the plot is thickening up here. This is Jesus speaking. This is read in the red letter edition of the Bible. He who overcomes and does my will. Jesus saying, someone else who overcomes and does my will, I will give him authority over the nations. That doesn't mean he'll be the president of one nation. Jesus is saying, I will transfer authority over the nations. In other words, I will transfer authority for the world to the one who overcomes. Even as I received of my Father, all my power, all my authority is going to someone else. Revelation 22, well, what's the morning star? Well, I tell you, we're going to pull this apart, man. We're going to pull this apart. We're going to nail every piece. I will give him the morning star. What's the morning star, you may ask? Jesus said what it is. Revelation 22, 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. I tell you, we're going to nail this thing, man. Exhibit A, exhibit B, conviction. Boom. Jesus is the morning star. He says, I'm going to give the morning star to someone else. He's going to transfer the entire authority of the Messiahship to another person. Revelation 2.17, He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone. Boy, we're going to nail this one. And in the stone, a new name written, which no man knows except he who receives it. Hmm. What's, what's the hidden manna? For the bread of God is he which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. It's John 6.33. I can't make this up. <laughs> it's all there, interestingly enough. I will give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white, well, what's the white stone then? Well, the white stone is here. 1 Peter 2, 4, Christ is the living stone, the chief cornerstone. 1 Corinthians 10, 5, the rock was Christ. Mm. And a new name written in that stone. If the stone is the Messiahship, and that stone's getting a new name, that means the Messiah is coming with another name. Jesus is not coming back, personally. Remember, Jesus was crucified. Nails in his hands, nails in his feet, sword in his side, crown of thorns. Gave up the spirit. Stone means the role of the Messiah. And now, the clincher. Him who overcomes will I, Jesus, make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall... He shall go no more out. 
Clearly, Jesus is talking about someone else. <laughs> I will write upon him, that guy, the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. New Jerusalem. That can only be a new place where the Messiah is going to be born, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and I will write upon him. What do you think Jesus is going to write upon that fellow? My new name. Can't make it up. Can't make it up. Jesus is coming back as somebody else. There will be a new Messiah. We're not even half done. Christ returned with a new name. Revelation 19, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. In righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Can't make it up, you know. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he has on his vesture and his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's a global leader. He will rule the nations with a rod of iron. That means an international leader. Jesus would have been that very international leader had the Roman Empire embraced him. Imagine Jesus. Augustus Caesar introducing Jesus in the Colosseum. Can you imagine what a different world it would be right now? Ladies and gentlemen, I know you view me as a god, and I understand that. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. However, <laughs> I brought a good friend from Israel that I want you to give your undivided attention to. The respect you had for me, you transfer every single bit of that to this gentleman right here, and then Jesus comes up, 100,000 people get to their feet. Caesar commanded it. You better get to your feet, <laughs> and fast. What would the world be like today? Very, very different. Very, very different world. How will the second advent take place? Boy, the precedent just keeps on rolling. Second coming. Up! Oh! There is real precedent, isn't there? This, this theme just kind of recurs and recurs. And it's right out of Scripture. Again, I can't make this stuff up. Expectation, Revelation 1, 7, clouds. Matthew 24, 30, clouds. Thessalonians, clouds. Boom, reality. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> just like before. Just like the second coming of Elijah, the first coming of Jesus, the second coming of Christ, born on the earth. Bang, Revelation 12, 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Messiah's coming back as somebody else. New name. New name. Can't get around it. Christ must come as a human being and grow to perfection in both spirit and body. Then, by engrafting all humanity with himself, he is to guide us to perfection both in spirit and body and make us qualified to be lords of both the physical and spiritual worlds. Jesus said, Come unto me, you that are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Jesus could impart the fullness of God to whoever wanted it. To whoever wanted it. How many? No one. At the cross, he hung alone. One guy showed faith. The thief on the right. Remember me, Lord, when you come into your kingdom. What did Jesus say? Truly, this day you will be with me in paradise. He's the only one. A, a thief, a murderer, dying next to him is the only one that did anything for Jesus Christ his entire life. And Jesus embraced him and said, you'll be with me. Sure enough, you'll be with me in paradise today. One person showed artistic unity and believed in him. How tragic. How unbelievably tragic. Christ has to be born on the earth. He grows up through three stages of growth. Remember, the four-position foundation. True Adam, true Eve, true family, true children. Boom! That's the kingdom of heaven. The problem with Adam and Eve is an eternal problem. It's been going on for 6,000 years, and it won't be resolved until true Adam, true Eve are on the earth, true family, 
bang, kingdom of heaven comes. It's that simple. It's not magic tricks. It's not dumping out of the sky. That's not going to bring the kingdom of heaven. True love between true man and true woman will bring love to the earth, will bring God to earth. God has to incarnate. That's why Messiah must come bodily as a man. Find Eve and restore the world. Conclusion. Section one. Born on earth with a new name. It's scriptural. Can't make it up. I didn't vary from scripture one single minute. That's section one. That's how will the Messiah come? Section two, when? 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 Uh, well, if we determined how the Messiah is coming, the next logical question is when? Again, no one knows the date. Not even the Son. Even Jesus said, I don't know when I'm coming back. How interesting. The Son of God doesn't even know when he's coming back. But you, brothers, are not in darkness that the day should come upon you as a thief. You are all children of the day. We are not of the night nor darkness. If, therefore, you do not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I'm coming. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken, and the other left. Classic example, precedent. Peter. Jesus by the seashore. Peter's with, we don't know how many other fishermen. Peter, drop your nets. I'll make you fishes of men. Peter dropped his net. Off he went. How many fishermen were left? That's the rapture. It has nothing to do with coming out of the sky and going floating off in the clouds. It's ridiculous. It's a matter of someone... <gasps> that man's incredible. That man's amazing. He's worthy of my allegiance. My fishing is unimportant. This is the Messiah. I can catch fish later. <laughs> right? Amazing. That's what this means. You can imagine that happened all over Jerusalem probably. At, at, the, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, people recognized him. Wow. Carpenters just put their saws down. Fishermen put their nets down. Tax collectors, well, they didn't put their money down. <laughs> Some will know while others do not. Imagine. People ate food with Jesus. They swam in the water with Jesus. They caught fish with Jesus. Breathed the same air and had no idea what was going on. You could be standing next to Jesus. It didn't look any different than anybody else. Two eyes, two arms, two legs, a nose. Laughs, jokes, serious, cries, goes to the bathroom. <laughs> but the quality of his character, the providential nature of his being is completely different from you. He's not you. Looks like you, but he's the son of God. So, we're answering the question, when? And now, God is revealing when. Because it's the time for that now. We're going to run through 4,000 years of history really fast. But when it's done, you'll see a time parallel that will astound you. If you're paying attention, this will astound you. The nation of Israel starts with Jacob's 12 sons and 70 kinsmen. I can back every single inch of this from Scripture and from history. But I'm gonna, like I said, we're going to run through this because we just don't have time. They enter into slavery in Egypt in fulfillment of the prophecy that he would be a slave in a land not his own based on the failure of his sacrifice years before. They go into slavery in Egypt. Moses comes 430 years into this slavery. Bang. Begins the period of Judges. The last judge, Samuel, anoints Saul the king of Israel. Saul passes it to David. David passes it to Solomon. This is the United Kingdom. Boom. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, Israel is taken into Assyria, captive, ten tribes. In the south, Judah, two tribes taken into Babylon. Divided kingdom for 400 years. Historians call this time the Babylonian exile and return. And this is actually pinpointed at 538 B.C. Very interesting. Almost to the, to the day. Uh, that's not supposed to be there. That comes in the next slide. Malachi comes about 400 years prior to Christ, predicts the coming of Elijah. 
There's what's called the 400 years of silence, and now it's preparation. God is now preparing Israel to receive the Messiah and the world simultaneously. Internally, God's preparing Israel. Externally, God is preparing the entire planet to receive Christ. You see Hellenism, Hebraism, uh, internal and external foundations, Roman empires at its absolute zenith, Confucius, Buddhism in the East, Socratic thought, Plato, Aristotle, all these amazing thinkers, technology, the Roman Empire dominates the world, aqueducts, the largest standing military on the planet, science, technology, incredibly advanced thought. So something's happening in the world to prepare for something very, very clearly. And it's very interesting that after this, after the crucifixion of Christ, Roman Empire is gone within 300 years, 400 years. Roman Empire is gone, Israel is destroyed, dark ages. Ooh. Roller coaster, boom, into the deck. Then Jesus comes. 2,000 years after Jacob's 12 sons, seven kids, Jesus comes, bang. First coming of Christ. Let's go back to that just for a second. Let that kind of sink in there. That's 2,000 years of history in about seven minutes. <laughs> now, after the death of Christ, that providence now moves on to the world level. We have the world level foundation to receive the Messiah now. Called the period of prolongation of restoration, 2,000 years of Christian history, beginning with Jesus' 12 disciples and 70 apostles, just like Jacob's 12 sons and 70 kinsmen, 2,000 years before, the worldwide Christian kingdom begins to form. Right away, they go into persecution in Rome, just like the Jews went into Egypt for 400 years. The Romans began to persecute the Christians for 400 years. Boom. Three, by 313, Constantine the Great has a vision and in the Edict of Milan declares the persecution of Christians ends right here. He gets a revelation in a dream. A shield appears with a cross on it and a voice came from heaven and said, by this conquer. By this conquer. And uh, there's all kinds of stories about Constantine's mother. Uh, uh, theoretically, had found the true cross of Christ about this time and broke it up into pieces and sent it all over the planet. You see artifacts all over, the, all over the world. Some of them are real, some of them are not. In the Council of Nicaea, 325, basic doctrine begins formation. They begin hammering out what is going to be our scripture, just like the Ten Commandments happened 2,000 years before with Moses, interestingly enough. Theodosius II, by 392, declares Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. From Nero in 70 AD, lighting Christians on fire to light his court, to, to be a citizen of the Roman Empire, you must publicly profess belief in Jesus Christ. You have to stand up publicly and say, I embrace Jesus Christ in order to be a, Ro a citizen of Rome, which was quite the privilege back then. Thank you very much. The New Testament by this point is canonized just like the Mosaic Law was in place 2,000 years before, which began the period of patriarchs, or the Pope, the Catholic Church, becomes, comes into the fore now. Charlemagne, interestingly enough, is crowned by Pope Leo on Christmas Day, 800 AD, just like Samuel, the last judge, anointed Saul king of Israel. Very interesting. The religious realm crowns the political realm. 800 years to the day. Exactly what happened 2,000 years prior to that. Charlemagne rules, passes the crown to Louis the Pious, his son. Louis the Pious has three sons, Lothair, Louis II, Charles the Bald, split the kingdom up, and they rule for 120 years. Judith of Bavaria causes civil war between the brothers, and the Roman Empire, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Christian Empire is now broken up into Eastern Orthodox, and you see it to this very day. Russia, East Bloc, it's all Eastern Orthodox, and then there's the Holy Roman Catholic Church. Italy, France, Spain, etc., etc., the entire Western world. That fracturing happened way back here. Now, I, let me see if that slide is still there. No, it looks like it's not. Let me see if I can get that up. This is an important slide, actually. This guy right here, I want that one. Even Martin Luther wrote about this time in the, in the Christian church and likened it to the Babylonian captivity of the Jews 2,000 years before. Interesting. The Babylonian captivity of the church, a prelude of Martin Luther on the Babylonian captivity of the church. He saw 
what was happening to the Catholic Church and the Christian Church at the time in the same terms as 2,000 years ago uh, prior to this when the Jews were taken into captivity in Babylon and Assyria. He saw a, a strange parallel even back in the 1500s. So, now, let's go here. And Babylon exile and return. The, the, ex, the papacy is taken by, abducted into Avignon, France for 70 years from 1307 to 77 in the same way that the Jews were taken into captivity for 70 years, exactly 2,000 years before that. And the papacy was returned over 140 years with the Council of Constance in 1417, restores the papacy back to Rome with Martin V, and there it's been to this day. Martin Luther, interestingly enough, comes at the same time Malachi came to the Jews 2,000 years prior to this. And Martin Luther is a reformer. Remember, Malachi had such a profound impact on the Jewish people that to this day they put out a plate for Elijah the prophet at Passover. So he was huge. He has four chapters in the Old Testament. Four measly chapters. But he had one of the most profound impacts on Jewish culture. Martin Luther had a profound effect on Christianity. Christianity was divided, centered on Martin Luther. In 1517, he nailed 95 theses on the door of the church of Wittenberg, Germany, outlining the offenses of the Catholic Church. Now, Martin Luther was a Catholic monk, by the way. Wasn't he had some kind of animus against the Catholic Church? He was a Catholic monk. <laughs> but he was outraged at what was going on within his own church. He loved his church. He said, but you're doing it all wrong. Selling indulgences, selling little pieces of paper to help build St. Peter's Cathedral, uh, Basilica. Buy this little piece of paper, you go to heaven. He knew that wasn't right. He knew the scripture, and that fractured Christianity into two enormous blocks to this day. This begins the final preparation period just like 2,000 years ago prior to the coming of Christ. What's been happening in this time? We said we're going to nail dates, times, and places. We're not done here. What's been going on for the last 400 years? A whole lot's been going on for the last 400 years. The Renaissance came and went. The Reformation, external, art, science, culture, ideology. Reformation, internal, the Wesley brothers. The entire Holy Spirit revolution throughout America in the 1700s, 1800s. Space travel. The formation of the blocks of the United States, freedom-loving democracies versus communism and the USSR. The Industrial Revolution, space travel, explosion of religion, global village. Now you can pick up your phone. My wife regularly Skypes to Portugal for free. Doesn't cost a penny. Talks to the family for hours. It's amazing. So, what's so doggone interesting about all that? Well, when you place these two timelines together, they get real interesting. Identical time periods following each other. When they say history repeats itself, it's not cliche. It literally repeats itself. And this is all established here. You can pick up any history book and see all this is backed up by dates, times, and places. This is fact. It's not our supposition. It's not our faith. This is history. <laughs> can't, again, we can't make this stuff up. What does that tell us? It tells us a lot. If you, in fact, take the timeline from Martin Luther as you would with Malachi and Jesus, take Martin Luther in 1517, the fracturing of the Christian church, come forward 400 years, preparation. Interestingly enough, it leaves us in 1917. Big deal, that's already come and gone. It is a big deal for many reasons. One, that's the year of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia where communism almost took over two-thirds of the world at one point. Man-centered paradise, anti-God ideology, the red dragon, mystery Babylon that sits on many waters. 